That four-page summary of the nearly two-year-long Mueller investigation issued by Attorney General Barr isn't the first time he's done something like that at the Justice Department. It turns out that 30 years ago, when he served in a different role in the department, he also issued a summary on a controversial issue that came under attack. And that's leading to questions about how he might redact the Mueller report. Randy Kate tonight has details. October 1989, a much younger William Barr caught up in a legal battle with Congress. At the time, Barr was head of the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel in the first Bush White House. He had authored a controversial memo that said the FBI could forcibly seize people in foreign countries without consent of that country's government. Some officials are calling the new FBI directive the President's Snatch Authority. One prime target might be Panama's General Noriega. News of the controversial memo surprised even President George H.W. Bush. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know what it is you're, I'll have to get back to you with the answer to your question. As with the Mueller report today, Barr was asked decades ago to provide his full legal opinion to Congress. Instead, Barr offered this 13-page summary of his principal conclusions. Barr reasoned that as head of the Office of Legal Counsel for the Justice Department, he provided legal advice throughout the administration on a confidential basis. Still, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee at the time wrote this letter to Barr's boss, the attorney general, requesting the full memo. It is my understanding that the opinion is unclassified and that it does not discuss ongoing investigations or litigation. Therefore, I can see no damage that would result from disclosure. Barr refused, wanting Congress to trust his summary. So Barr was called to testify. As NYU law professor Ryan Goodman first noted on JustSecurity.org, Barr argued that opinions from his office had been treated in the past as confidential. But the House Judiciary Chair quickly pointed out DOJ had published other opinions up until 1985. The outrage over the memo continued. Secretary of State James Baker tried to play it down. This uh, procedure will not be used absent a full interagency discussion of all aspects of it. Finally, in 1993, long after Congress first subpoenaed the full report, it was made public. Barr was long gone from his position at the DOJ. The Clinton administration published Barr's full 29-page opinion, allowing the public to see it for the first time. Turns out Barr omitted key principal conclusions in his summary to Congress. In it, Barr failed to disclose that his full 1989 opinion concluded that the president has the power to authorize actions that violate the U.N. Charter. Also, that the attorney general, as well as the president, have executive power to authorize overseas abductions. It ought to be a very rare thing. We, we can't just be an international ramble wandering around doing whatever we want, regardless of international law. Another key omission? Barr failed to tell lawmakers that in his full opinion from 1989, he concluded that the president can override customary international law. He had told Congress that the full document is strictly a legal analysis of the FBI's authority as a matter of domestic law. Details from another time, now under the microscope. Randy Kay, CNN, New York. Well, joining me now, someone who criticized what Barr did back then, Yale uh, Law School professor Harold Coe, also with us, CNN legal analyst Kerry Cordero, and Jeffrey Tubin. <laughs> professor Coe, given your knowledge of Barr's 1989, 1989 memo, I wonder what went through your mind when you saw the term principal conclusions in his letter summarizing Mueller's report. Well, you know, uh, Anderson, athletes and uh, uh, Dancers have signature moves, and so do lawyers. And uh, Bill Barr's is sort of a four-step process. First, refuse and deny, uh, delay. Second, uh, summarize. Third, slant. And four, omit. So he was there asked by a congressional committee for the opinion. He refused and delayed. Second, uh, when asked to give something, he summarized. Third, when he offered the conclusions, he slanted it toward his client. And then when the re opinion was finally released three years later, it turned out it admitted some of the most uh, uh, unfavorable conclusions to his client. So you had this sort of familiar feeling when you're watching someone do something you've seen before. 
And uh, the question, obviously, is is something omitted and something slanted? And we'll find that out on Thursday, I guess. Kerry, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to hear what the professor is saying. Do you think this raises legitimate questions about the credibility of, of his Mueller report summary, first of all? Well, I think it does raise questions about whether or not um, this is a pattern of behavior that he's engaged in. I'm going to hold judgment until I see what he actually releases in the report on Thursday. I think it also the accusations that he had withheld some information also are actually um, as relevant, if not uh, just as relevant, as allegations that he had mistakenly portrayed the law. So some of the arguments about his 1989 memo are that he actually got the law wrong. And so what I'm looking for on Thursday is whether or not the facts that are revealed in the report show that he got the law on obstruction wrong. Hmm. Think about one thing Harold said. Three years. It took three years to get the underlying document. And given the way the legal system works, I wouldn't be surprised if it takes three years or potentially never that um, the House of Representatives gets access to the full, unredacted Mueller report. And that would mean we'll never know for sure. Uh, whether he redacted Why would it take probably. that, or why does it take that long? Be, because uh, the legal system w works slowly. I mean, ha Harold can answer why it took three years in that, in that circumstance, but you know that the White House is going to fight and the Justice Department is going to fight district court, circuit court, court uh, Supreme Court potentially, and, you know, it could be more than one round. There could be other agencies that want to re redact things. So, you know, the, the, what makes this even more frustrating, potentially, is we won't know what he actually redacted. Professor Coe, why did it take three years in the past? Well, the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department, which is the General Counsel's office, it's where I used to work, uh, they used to publish their opinions. In fact, they published them all through the mid-80s under Republican administrations when Ted Olson was the head. Um, starting around the time that Barr became the head, they started to declare them confidential, or increasingly they started to call them drafts, so they never became final. And then when someone tried to get them, they would say that they were legally privileged. Um, you know, the comment was made that we have to uh, withhold judgment. I, I'm, I've known Bill Barr for 39 years. You know, he's a lawyer of considerable repute, but you know, you have to look for the 13th chime of the clock, and we've now had three. First, his, you know, unsolicited letter about obstruction. Second, a statement about spying. And then third, this uh, kind of signature move. And so it makes one worried um, uh, as to uh, the possibility that he tilted this one also. Professor Coe, does it make sense to you? I mean, as somebody who has redacted documents, should it take three weeks to go through the 400-some uh, pages of the Mueller report to redact? No. Um, so first of all, depending on how many people you put on it, uh, you could get it done in a couple of days. Secondly, and, and the thing that I think hasn't been mentioned enough, and Jeff should comment since he was on a similar special prosecutor's force, uh, you know, Mueller's team was a team. It was uh, people who were extremely experienced with handling these kinds of materials. They knew the pressure that uh, uh, there was under for public release. And um, they would have done, I assume, everything to make it uh, release ready. Uh, and I think what the leaks that we heard about the summaries uh, fit into that. If there were sources and methods information on, on intelligence, uh, that would have been uh, you know, put down into a footnote that could be easily redacted. They tried to keep the narrative clean. Um, and, you know, a lot of what you do when you're preparing the public release of a report that has classified material is do exactly that kind of redaction. So three weeks uh, makes it more and more suspicious. Finally, it is very rare that at additional levels of review that someone says, somebody else redacted this, now I'm going to unveil it. People just add more redactions mm. until it starts to look like a piece of Swiss cheese. So. Three weeks. I'm sorry, there's another point about the timing, though. It's one thing to delay three weeks. It's another thing to come out of the box <clears throat> immediately after two days and, and, you know, give a clean bill of health to the president of the United States. You know, it'd be one thing if he delayed the whole thing, but he actually 
uh, embraced a very favorable uh, interpretation to the president and then made everybody wait for three weeks, acting as hmm. letting the impression set in that there was essentially nothing to see here. Carrie, well, in your... Release, go ahead, Carrie. The, the release of the letter, though, it did in some ways box the attorney general in because the report is going to come out. Now, we can, we'll can we see whether or not it is as transparent as the attorney general says it's going to be or if, like Harold says, it's going to be a document that looks more like Swiss cheese. But we're going to know one way or another whether uh, he is redacting so much information as to hide what is in the actual report. Interesting. Uh, well, we'll be seeing it. Uh, Professor Coe, appreciate it. Jeff Tubin, Kerry Cordero, thanks very much. Thanks.